another um, pathway for the fate of this um, complex ammonia um, where Randy talked about the ambient air issues. Um, there's another pathway, and that is what happens um, when those particles um, slow down in the atmosphere and, and deposit. Um, so with that, Jessica Davis, um, with help from Nicole Marsalak, um, who are from Colorado State, will share um, their experiences in um, working with agriculture and the impacts in, in the Rocky Mountain National Park. Thanks, Ron. It's a pleasure to be with you all today. I uh, am going to be focusing my presentation on what's going on in Rocky Mountain National Park, but it is just one example. The same kinds of processes occur wherever nitrogen deposition is an issue. I, I'd just like to start off by repeating and emphasizing a point that Dr. Martin just made, and that is that ammonia all by itself has a pretty limited transport, transport distances. But when ammonia combines with those sulfuric and nitric acids in the atmosphere, then it becomes particulate matter, and that increases its transportability considerably, up to 1,000 miles or even more. And because of that, that means that the causes of problems in Rocky Mountain National Park aren't necessarily local to the park. So what I'll be visiting with you about today is outlined here. We'll start to talk about what are some of the impacts in Rocky Mountain National Park. Then we'll visit about sources of nitrogen deposition. We'll move on to the political responses that have occurred. And finally, spend a few minutes on what CSU has been doing about all of this. So we start off with environmental impacts in the park. Well, nitrogen is deposited in two different forms, both uh, dry deposition and wet deposition. Since ammonia salts are hydroscopic, they attract water around those uh, salts, and that basically facilitates that wet deposition or falling with rain or snowfall. Oops. Just a second. Oh, it seems that we're missing a slide, but that's okay. Uh, that previous slide was just to show that, as is often the case in mountains, as we increase in elevation, there is a higher precipitation, and what comes along with that is also higher nitrogen deposition at higher elevations. So th this slide shows how the nitrogen deposition has changed over time. And there have uh, been documented increases in nitrogen deposition in the park over the last 20 years. The background is considered to be only 0.2 kilograms per hectare per year. And so the, the current numbers are uh, averaging about 2.6 or say 2.4 pounds of nitrogen per acre per year. Only the wet deposition is measured because it's easier to measure. But dry depositions uh, predicted to be about 50% of that. So when we put that all together, we're getting about 3.6 pounds of nitrogen per acre per year, in particular at high elevations. Now, that may not seem like very much. From an agricultural standpoint, that's really quite a little bit of nitrogen. But because the alpine ecosystems are much more sensitive, there's less buffering capacity there, that small amount can have a large impact. And here's a picture you can see here that shows what it typically looks like at high elevation. There's exposed bedrock with steep slopes. There's very little uh, what you could call soil or and very little vegetation. And in addition to that, the vegetation is only growing for very short growing seasons. So when rain or snow falls on these landscapes, and it melts in the spring snow melts, there's not a lot of buffering capacity there. And so because of that lack of buffering capacity, there have been documented increases in nitrate levels in surface water in the park. And the, it's interesting because the vegetation around the lake has shown to be very important as to why sometimes in some lakes there is not a documented increase and in other lakes there is. Uh, so when there uh, is not much vegetation but mostly rocky 
slopes without vegetation, then the nitrate levels uh, have been shown to be increasing. But in areas like in this slide where you see a lot of vegetation around the lake, so these types of lakes are not showing that increase in nitrogen levels in the lakes. Now this is quite different in some ways from coastal communities or areas where the nitrogen is deposited directly on water bodies, but really the impacts are the same. In addition to water, there have also been documented changes in the park in soils and in trees. And so we see higher nitrogen levels in the soil and in the needles of pine trees and that affects the different ratios with increased nitrogen to phosphorus ratios in the pine needles and, and lower carbon to nitrogen ratios in soil. So those small, dif small differences actually do make a difference. So now the big question is where is that nitrogen coming from? Well the measurements show that the inorganic nitrogen in that wet deposition is about 55% nitrate and about 45% ammonium. And so we'll focus the, this uh, presentation on the ammonium fraction. The state of Colorado, specifically the Department of Public Health and Environment, has recently developed an inventory of all the different ammonia sources in the state. And some of them are listed here on the slide. You can see some of those things listed are not things that we can control or we could regulate. Things like wildlife emissions or emissions from native soils, even human perspiration, these things are, are not uh, going to be easy to control. But other aspects such as industrial emissions or agricultural end up then having a large, uh, uh, be having a potentially larger impact when we eliminate those uncontrollable sources. So when the state of Colorado does that and their calculations eliminate the uncontrollable ammonia sources, it turns out that according to their estimates, 60% of ammonia emissions in the state are coming from agriculture. 40% of that from livestock and the remaining 20% from fertilizer. Now there's a lot of debate about this inventory as I'm sure you can imagine, but um, this is the, these are the numbers that we have today. So what's been going on politically? This is where it really gets fun. Um, the National Park Service really uh, started this whole process when they released a report documenting that nitrogen deposition in Rocky Mountain National Park was causing changes to the ecosystem. And then what came next was that the public, especially people who live around the park or people who are regular visitors to the park, became concerned about the nitrogen deposition to the park and they became more vocal in voicing those concerns. And then next, in 2005, our Colorado Air Quality Control Commission formed a subcommittee to focus on Rocky Mountain National Park. And the purpose of this committee was twofold. One was to look at where is the nitrogen coming from and then secondly to develop a plan or what are we going to do about this kind of a plan. And that plan was finalized in August of 2007 and the agricultural portion of that plan focuses on voluntary best management practices to reduce ammonia emissions. It is a 25-year plan and it's written into the plan that every five years there will be an assessment about whether the voluntary best management practice approach is achieving the, the necessary reductions in nitrogen deposition in the park. So the clock is already ticking. We're almost already one year through that first five-year period. The agricultural community has been very involved in this process through with the subcommittee and developing this plan. A variety of people from agriculture, from many different uh, both livestock and crop producer groups and political groups have been involved in working together and developed an ag strategy. And that strategy has several uh, parts to it. It includes research because there are, of course, research needs that would help us uh, to do a better job. Uh, there are gaps in the inventory that need to be filled and there are some questions about modeling that's been done. And 
And then in addition, of course, there's the educational component that's uh, so important if we're going to create change. So what has CSU been doing besides going to a lot of meetings? Uh, we have a project that's funded by the NRCS Conservation Innovation Grant Program. And in that project, we have been testing these best management practices on farms, specifically on dairies and feedlots. Last year and this year, we're about halfway through this uh, on-farm testing program. And what we're trying to do here is take best management practices that have been identified in, in the literature that may have shown promise under laboratory settings and want to take them to the field and see, do they really work under field conditions? If so, how much do they work? How much ammonia reduction can we get? How practical are they? Do they cause other problems that maybe wouldn't be obvious in the lab setting? And what about the cost of implementation? What we really want to do is be able to identify the BMPs that have the, the that we can get the most bang for our buck with, right? So we can get the most reduction in nitrogen em emissions for the dollar that we spend on them. CSU is also doing a producer survey, and uh, this is sent not just to Colorado, but to neighboring states as well, because of course the nitrogen doesn't stop at the uh, state boundary. And uh, our goal here is to understand what BMPs people are already using, uh, how aware they are about the issues in the park and whether that affects their decisions and what constraints there are to adopting more BMPs. You know, specifically, do they need cost share programs or do they need educational or technical support in order to implement BMPs? So the answers to this survey will be combined then with the BMP testing to help us to know best which BMPs not only show the most practice, but also have the potential, highest potential for actually being implemented and having an impact up in the park. And then uh, the final part of CSU's role is, of course, the extension process. We've just unveiled a, a new website that the address is shown here, ammoniabmp.info. That website, when it's finished, will include uh, online fact sheets uh, of the, the best BMPs that we were able to identify, photos of BMPs in action, and a cost estimator that helps people to estimate how much it would cost to get to, to implement a BMP and how much ammonia reduction can you really get for that. So that is where we're headed. Overall, our goal at CSU is to work together with producers to to encourage adoption of proven BMPs, and especially because we want to preserve both the environment in Rocky Mountain National Park and, of course, preserve agriculture for future generations as well. I'd be happy to take questions after the third presentation. Thank you.